one point of decision. It, it cannot be that, oh, um, you know, that guy said that, that guy said that, 15 other people. So he, the product owner, he or she, has to shield the team from all the confusion back in their own organization. So he has to deal with the politics, he has to deal with the, uh, you know, arm twisting, whatever. He will be the one to come back and say A, B, and C is the top priority and I'm ready to go for it for this spring. That's the key. And that's hard actually. Most organizations have difficulty in finding a product owner. Usually the person who is at a position to do that, uh, usually also busy in other things. So they don't want to give enough time. And that's also a problem. Uh, those are realities. In, but you know, you, you kind of try to anticipate and you kind of try to push them to appoint someone as the product owner who's going to dedicate enough time for the project. So that's the product owner. That's the, there's another term for the product owner called the single ring of neck. <laughs> <laughs> Ring about neck. Because he's the one determining the, the direction of the project. Remember, um, we told you in Agile projects they have the product problem. The product owner owns the product problem. He's the one who says, these are the next things that you should be doing. He's not your guy. I mean, if you're a provider, he's coming from the client. Usually, yeah, it, it should be the client's uh, representative. Yeah. Because remember, you gave them, you gave the customer basically the responsibility of how, what, uh, that the team is going to do, and it should be their responsibility to determine what uh, what that is. And it's this just person hard. needs to understand agile. Yeah. If he doesn't understand agile, and if he doesn't understand at least a little of technology, you're in trouble. So that's the product owner. Uh, Sometimes what happens is we recommend someone they can hire. If they don't have a product owner. Um, we recommend we can find and we can help There's actually them. training I, for, for product owners as well. So you can train, you can send people yeah. from the client organization to these kinds of things. So, ah, okay, this is, these are, so it's it's a little bit like project management, so, but um, very different, uh, I guess. The next one, Scrum Master. Scrum Master. The Scrum Master is a, it's a clean, it's, uh, it's also it's, it's like a coach. Uh, it's it's more like he's not part. He's not a project manager, but he does take on some responsibilities in terms of okay, uh, if you're saying we're agile or we're using Scrum, the Scrum master is the one that makes sure that the process is being followed. That okay, there are certain rules that you need to uh, basically follow in Scrum, and the Scrum master's role is. To make sure that, for example, the relationship between the product owner and the team uh, who's actually doing the development is healthy. Because it can be, like for example, one of the things that can happen is a product owner can be pushy and say, I want you to finish a hundred things in the sprint. And then but but the, the, the development team can say, but we can only finish fifty of these items, really, realistically. If we if we have to finish the one hundred items, then um, we'll do overtimes, we'll have to do overtimes. And, but if the product owner is pushy, um, he'll say, yeah, then go on overtime. The Scrum Master will say, wait, um, hey, product owner, if you force them on overtime this week, then they're going to be too tired next week, and their productivity will drop next week. And then your next delivery, next iteration will suffer. So maybe it's more prudent for you to understand Okay, so the, the, uh, the Scrum Master is more like a coach. He you know? can also advise the team and say, well, these are the problems that you're having. You need to improve your engineering uh, practices. You need to do this and do that. And maybe make suggestions on, on how to improve the problem. So the Scrum Master um, role is basically to um, improve the process. The team members do not report directly to the Scrum Master. It's not a project manager, it's more like a coach and advisor. It's hard to reshape the mind of a product uh, project manager into a Scrum Master. Uh, a lot of time, it's a tough one. 
if you ask the project managers who migrated from being project manager to be a scrum master, a lot of things to be unlearned, a lot of things that to let go. The ideal state of scrum is a self-managed team without the need of a scrum master even. So uh, success of the scrum master in the beginning a lot more handholding, but down the line once everything goes smooth, you can actually disengage uh, the scrum master nearly. So the, the third element is the team. The team is basically, the idea is uh, because you're delivering by features, and what's of value is not the design, a code, but it's whether the team was able to deliver a feature that's working that the client can use, right? So the team is not just the developers, um, it's not just the developers and the business analysts, it's everybody that needs to be part of that delivery. And that usually involves developers, business analysts, testers, and cross-functional even. Yeah, so the idea is we have a cross-functional team that can accomplish uh, a whole, an entire set of features and deliver it. Uh, instead of, we have these sometimes vertical organizations where we have a, a PM department, a PM department, we develop uh, a, a, um, something like a uh, uh, business analyst, business analyst, project management, QA. Um, one, Agile favors is a cross-functional team. You can still have these departments, but their primary responsibility once they get into a team is that team and delivering for that team. And you do whatever it takes to make yeah, it. And the idea is the whole team now has to work in order to deliver a future. So the mindset of a team is I gotta work and work with this team in order to deliver something. I might be primarily a QA person, or I might be primarily a developer person, but if the QA is overburdened, uh, and because of the fact that he's overburdened, he can't deliver his work, and then it ends up that what we deliver is not yet done because he's basically overburdened, then it's up to us to help that person and say, okay, what can we do to help you so that we can? So in the end, the, important, the thing that's important for the team is not whether they're functioning individually, their work well, or if I'm doing testing well, or if I'm coding well. It's more like, as a team, were we able to deliver the feature that we want, that we set out to do? So then their mindset changes, because now they're focused on delivery, which is what you want. You want them to not be focused on, well, individual <coughs> skills, but rather, as a team, what can we do for It's either the sprint is a failure or a success. Yeah. There's no halfway. There's no, I'm done 95%. It's nothing like that. Either all of them are done or it's not done. So, yeah. In the Scrum Master, how is the mode also how to develop? Can you help? Huh. Well, that's uh, again that same controversial topic. Yeah, of, actually, uh, sometimes we do have scrum masters that, that code, but there's a natural tendency to. Uh, the reason why you want the, the scrum master to be a different person is because you don't want the scrum master to be the one they will report to. Because if you're a member of the team, they, they the tendency is they'll defer to you and say, we'll do what you want. And the idea of a, the team is you want them to become uh, self-managing team, meaning they will organize the work according to how they can best deliver. So what you need to do is you need to motivate the team and say, okay, the Scrum Master role is, okay, you need to be conscious that in the end, uh, what's important is not your individual accomplishments, but it's the team's accomplishments, whether you were able to deliver this as And by doing that, you'll make the product for the team, right? You can deliver the things that you set out to do. And you want them to focus on that. And as a scrum master, it's like you have to be an external person to do that. If you're part of the team, the tendency is they'll just listen to you and they never learn to do it on their own. That's why usually we advise uh, the scrum master to be a different person, not part of the team. But of course, of course, there's always exceptions. Like the reality is, oh, we need the uh, the, the only certified scrum master or the good scrum master we can find is also developing, so a senior architect. So yeah, 
little bit. Well, I mean, you can make exceptions. Huh? Like everything else, there's always exceptions to the rule. Like, <laughs> in reality, yeah, you do make exceptions. Okay, so moving to the other items, um, stakeholders and managers, so they are involved. So in the language of Scrum, um, this three, uh, well actually the team alone is called the pigs. pigs. Um, and the rest are called the chickens. Now why is that? Why is it? So you know, have you heard that story? The, or the chicken, the pig. Opening a store together, restaurant. Yeah. So no. Uh, okay. Yeah. So there was this. There was this. Uh, there was this uh, chicken pig. No, no. Yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, um, well, not actually chick boys. It's more like um, ham and eggs. Okay. So the restaurant was going to call ham and eggs. And so, but so the chicken invited the pig. Let's open a uh, restaurant called ham and eggs. But the pig said, well, I have a problem with that. <laughs> because the chicken uh, They're just involved. involved. The chicken is just involved, involved in laying the egg. the eggs. But the pig is going to be committed because it's going to be turned into ham. Ah. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's partly how the team is. The team actually, so when we have the stand-up meetings, uh, even you know the CEO, you stand a line behind. The team decides and talks. The chickens don't talk during the scrum meeting. It's only the pigs who are allowed Hello. to. The idea is uh, it takes commitment to deliver software, and the people are involved in the in committing to it. So, for example, at the start of the sprint, we say, "Well, we have we've decided we can deliver these five items." And it's not the product owner who can say, you have to deliver those five items. It's a team that says, we're committing to deliver those five items. This is how much work we can do based on our estimates. And because they're making that commitment, they're, they have uh, basically a responsibility to try their best. Of course, they can be wrong. Of course, we, 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 do, uh, we still accept the fact that People can make mistakes and make an overestimate. Um, but the idea is once you make a commitment, you do your best to finish that commitment. And so the people who make the commitment are the pigs. And this is primarily the team. The product owner is not the pig because his responsibility is to make sure that, okay, you said you give me these five items. At the end of the sprint, I expect you to give me this kind of ten So he's not making the commitment, it's the team that's making the commitment. Okay. And the scrum master. The scrum master is also just an advisor, so he's also a chicken. Now, all the other people during the sprint, you want the team to be focused on delivering that goal. So that, so that what you don't want to do is, ah, um, in the middle of the sprint while they were working, I need you to pull out. I need you to do something else. Then that prevents them from delivering that. That, uh, in fact, that's the job of the Scrum Master, to stop the outside influence. Yeah, it's to reduce, okay, you want uh, productive teams. And the way you want to make them productive is by making them focus on their goal. And by making that commitment early on, the start of the sprint. And it's a short sprint, so it's not like three months, no? Every 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 sprint is a short um, time thing where the, the goals are pretty concrete. So you need to finish these five items. But it's not like, oh, I'll sit around, wait for the... It's like, these things are, you committed to them, you have, so you force them, you, you make them more productive by saying short-term goals that are realizable in short scripts. And then that's, the, that's how you make them more productive. And the thing is, it's like, uh, because they're pigs, they're committed to that. It's like, time and time, over, over the life of the project, what you will see is not the usual stuff where, ah, the start of the project, we can relax because the deadlines are not off. No, the deadlines are always short. It's mm -hmm. one week to do this. So the, the effort is now distributed. That's why we also don't want them to be working over time. And the mistakes are also small. Yeah. And the, you don't want them working over time all the time because the idea is you want to distribute the effort over the life of the project, <coughs> not at the end where everybody's scrapping for the 
what we want is we want to space out the development so that their effort uh, is intense, but it's sustainable over the life of the project. We go a little faster, uh, but uh, I think we covered the, the philosophy is clear hopefully by now. Now, um, the subject matter expert is not a standard uh, member of the Scrum team, but it's very essential for distributed Scrum. I'll go to that once I cover that topic in a short. Um, okay, these are the few key meetings and outputs that happen. So backlog grooming is basically for both product backlog. Uh, it's a regular event like we talked about. The product owner and the team should work in refining the backlog, improve the story. Generally, what you do is you start with the what you call epic stories, huge, large amount of feature like a banking system, the whole casa or something like that. And then you start breaking it down. You break it down to what you call coarse grain. And then you break it down further to what we call fine grains. The fine grains are the ones which goes into the spring. And in the spring, you break them down to the task level. So that's that's generally the sequence. And this whole process is the grooming. So the idea is you keep the product backup updated so that it reflects what the client really wants at this point in time. So these are the most important things. So that can change. And it's fine if it can change because remember, as long as the, the team hasn't started on it, they can change it any way they want. So that's why it's a lot more flexible, it's more yeah. agile in that sense because we can change the plans fairly quickly. As long as you haven't started on it, it's okay to keep changing everything. You might ask, should ask by right now, uh, the question like, how does it depend? Like, how do you handle the dependency of one feature? To the other usually there is right so what happens is if someone asks you for a certain feature ahead of time uh, it might affect in a way that certain other feature you need for that to happen you might have to uh, curve out some part of that into this one so generally if a particular feature um, say was this one but for it to work it needs another part and originally this was size 5 I'll go to the sizing let's say this was size 5 but because it was moved up in priority and now we have to add something more for it to work so it might become 7 or 8 or something like that so that's how you not only move the stories up and down but you also um, fix what else needs into that and how it affects the sizing what else? Um, we talked about ship of uh, this one. So spring planning is usually spring planning one and spring planning two. Spring planning one is so if this is the spring, the day one, this is where the spring planning happens. So there are two parts of it. Part one is with the product owner and the team, uh, where the stories are kind of um, yeah you discuss it. You discuss it. Usually you, it's good to narrate it back. Like if you are the developer, you kind of say, okay, from reading this, I understand it to be this, and I'm going to build this, something like that. And the product owner kind of confirms to reduce the confusion or mistakes. And this is where the team starts understanding what needs to be built, and also why. So that's the part one of the screen planning. Part two, the product owner is not in the meeting anymore, but available for clarification. And during this, the, uh, the team breaks down the task into, uh, sorry, breaks down the stories into tasks. So the idea here is uh, once we know what needs to be built, how do we build it? So it, you, do, you don't need to involve the product owner anymore. It's like, ah, we need to build a screen like this. We need to design something like this. We need to add fields to a table. So that's when you start discussing what tasks need to be done. That's the part of the split. And if there is a question, you go to the product owner and so clarify. There might be things that need to be clarified, so you need to go back. But in general, it's more like the team talking. How do you organize the work so that um, we can start bringing it down and saying, ah, this will be done, this, 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 this. And we need to keep track of that. So that <coughs> One um, good rule of thumb is to break task down to four hour or less size. So the idea is it's 
Point game. So you really know what needs to be done in a sprint. So there's no question, um, what else do we need to do? Um, the sprint backlog reflects basically a list as well of the tasks that are associated with each um, user story or, or major feature that's in part of the sprint. So for example, I have one story to build, uh, remember me. Ah, okay, what else do we need to do that? Uh, what, what tasks do we, what tasks are associated with that? Well, maybe we need to add a new field, that kind of thing. And then we start estimating how long it will take to do that. So you can see the sprint backlog is a, a refined or a more detailed plan of what you need to do in a sprint. So it's really very detailed. And there's no question among the developers what needs to be done. Right. So, um, and then at the end of the sprint, so let's say two weeks, at the end of the sprint, you do what you call a sprint review. Um, most of the time we call it demo, but demo might be the wrong word because demo means the team is going to show and then the PO is going to uh, replicate. But generally, it's trying to be more uh, encompassing. So it's supposed to be a review. So OK, we all agreed upon building this, and this is what we have. And uh, that's, that's what it's, it's still like a demo. So again, it's, it's providing the feedback um, for what the team did uh, and what the uh, product owner was expecting. So it's like, uh, this is where we review. This is what we were able to finish. This is what we weren't able to finish, and also clarifications. Like, ah, okay, uh, this missing. Or this this is happen. missing, or uh, maybe there's a there was a misunderstanding here. Those are those are the things that are revealed during the sprint review. And again, it's something that you do every sprint. So again, the, just think of it as something that controls the project because based on the feedback of the sprint, you can change the product backlog. You can say, ah, you weren't able to finish this. We gotta do this the next day. Okay. The last one is the uh, Sprint Retro. Uh, this one, a lot of teams uh, miss out in doing. Yeah. But this is one of the most important aspect of Scrum. Uh, <clears throat> think of it like, you know, the concept of Kaizen, you know, Kaizen continuous improvement. Uh, that's, that's basically where well, one is you can have a little bit of beer and stuff and you know, uh, lose some steam, but along with it, it's basically to point out among each other, because a lot of time there is some tension built up within the team, right? Uh, because someone has been goofing around and well, everyone else was working or stuff like that, you might tolerate it for a sprint or two, but this is where the team kind of uh, discusses it out and say, hey, you go up this whole sprint, but uh, hopefully next one, otherwise we're going to kick you out or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's one. The, the idea here is um, the distinction between the sprint review and the sprint retro is, um, if you think about it, the sprint planning is about, okay, this is what we want to build. So the sprint review is, did we build it right? Um, did we build the right product? Or the like, right way. The right, no, the product right. Uh, no, no. The right product. Are we building the right features, the right set of features? Uh, so the sprint, that's our goal of the sprint review. The sprint retro is: Did we build the product right? It's like the process of building it. We focus on the team. That's why it's about how did we build? How did you do your work? And what can we do to improve it? So the idea here is: At the end of each sprint. The team reviews how they did their work, not just the output, but the process, and see if they can improve it. What problems did they find? Ah, the client was slow in getting back to us, and that's the reason why uh, we didn't get it. We, we didn't get the feedback until the end, and then we didn't have time to fix it. Okay, what can we do the next time? But there are different ways. There are established. There are even you can download this, um, you know, uh, emotional graph, etc. You know, you can. Uh, so there are different ways, and you can download it by just googling it. Um, different ways to do it. And the same way, there are different ways of doing a uh, story or you know, how to refine it. So we won't go into that much detail. And any of these terms, if you just go to Wikipedia and look at Scrum, it's all there with all the details. So. Don't worry about it. What we want to focus on 
is the essence of it, the whole logic behind. Because you can get a whole bunch of reading material to read on it anyways. Now, oh, okay, velocity. So a control of scrum is the velocity. Now what is velocity? Before going to velocity, maybe I should talk about uh, the sizing. So uh, if you, so okay, how do you size something? So like, are these two of same size? No. Okay. Now if I have this two, so I say this is one and this is uh, three. What is this? Huh? <laughs> don't take, don't take her in that <laughs> Okay, but yeah, really, what, what do you think this is? If, yeah, this is one, this is three, more like four, okay. So, the point is, uh, the human mind can easily triangulate comparisons. Okay, so if I say uh, this is one and this is ten, and if I ask what is this or closer to you, say this, is it same? No, a little bigger. This is something human mind can comprehend very easily. Um, as long as you don't ask in hours. <laughs> <laughs> so don't ask, this one is this many hours and this is this many hours and how many hours is this? Because that's where other thoughts come into play. So don't ask that question. Okay, ask the question about the size. Now, there are other theories, what you call Fibonacci series. Uh, you guys are mostly engineers, you know Fibonacci series, right? So Fibonacci series is usually good in asking the sizing. Why? Uh, Fibonacci has a tendency of removing that thing, like uh, you say this is um, this is four, if this is three, so uh, then someone might say, no, that's three and a half. So, those kind of discussion you want to remove and you just go by Fibonacci series. So there are numbers in the series 1, 1, 3, 5, 7, whatever. So you know you pick one of them. Yeah, either it's 1 or it's 7 or it's 13 or it's 21. You know, you go by that. And that reduces the now there are different ways of doing it. One is called poker planning. So basically you give a set of cards, Fibonacci card to each other, and then uh, you just pick up one story, uh, but before you start, you should triangulate. So it's better to say that, okay, uh, since we always do um, login screens, uh, let's say that is seven, okay, and then whatever, forgot password is uh, one, maybe not, but whatever it is, so you just say that. After that, you go about, now pick up another story, say, okay, what do you guys think? And then everyone kind of picks their own card. Uh, so, and then everyone shows together. So now generally it will be like, okay, three, 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 seven, why do you think it's seven? So you explain that, ah, I think there's this, so maybe she saw something that we missed, but maybe she was mistaken. So that way you kind of uh, normalize it. So that's the poker planning, and that's how you size the backlog items. Once you have sized the backlog items, then you pull them into your sprint. And what you call is burning them. So, you know, in the period, you finish them, so you burn. So, in the beginning of the sprint, let's say you have, um, so this is a graph. So, this is like the different days. So, this is, let's say, the 10th day. Okay. And this is day one. Okay. Now, when you start, you have, let's say, 30 points equivalent and in theory you should burn down like that but it doesn't really always go that way this is your tracking how is your sprint going this is called a burn down chart so every day as you make progress you finish one task so maybe nothing happened for the first two days and then you finish something so okay it was worth maybe 10 points so you kind of get Okay, then point here. So the first day might look like this, second day it drops here, and so forth. Okay, so generally if everything goes fine, somehow it should kind of finish around that. Or you might not meet. So that means certain points were short. 
uh, in burning down. So you did not mean 30, you meant 25 maybe. What that is, that number 25 is the velocity. Meaning the team can burn down a certain amount of point. And you you uh, don't just take one incident. There will be so many reasons why one was. So you know you can go by averaging of three, averaging of five. As the process matures, the velocity become consistent. The idea is uh, your velocity determines because it's just points. It doesn't tell you hours. It's very individualistic. It's how the team determines attack or a story. It's, it's ah, this is how many points. That's very team specific. You can't compare the points across teams. It's how they remember. It's just an arbitrary number. But the idea is. If they keep doing it and doing it, then they become consistent. And remember that you do this estimation as part of the backlog, the backlog grooming, as part of the sprint process um, uh, during the sprint planning. You do estimates. Huh? Now, remember that question. Does Agile provide you with? Does make does it make you a better estimator? And if you give me a project, can I estimate better than you? I can say no, but because of the way we do it, because this, the estimation is not done just at the start of the project, but that, um, every sprint, and the fact that we're doing it consistently, and there's a feedback cycle, because if we say, we estimate we can do 30 points, and we were only able to do 10 points, ah, maybe our the next time, we'll just commit to 10 points, 10 points for the, for the sprint. So this is the amount of work that we can do. And the next time, ah, we were able to do 15. Ah, okay. Then we beat our velocity is 15. Well, the next time we'll estimate for the amount of work that we do, we'll estimate 15 points. And remember that this thing is something that's ongoing. It's like, it's not just done once. Because the problem with estimating a project is we don't do it frequently. We, we do it once at the start of the project. We say, it'll take six months. Here, we're doing it consistently. And the other thing is, we're estimating small items. We're only estimating a certain amount of work. And that's why we become, we become better estimators. Because we're estimating small chunks of work, and we're doing it consistently. And we try to make the team stable. It's like, we're not increasing the number of people. You don't change the number every spring or, or something like that. Or change the length. That, that's why we become better. That's why at the end of usually seven sprints, what the team estimates and says, we can finish this work, they usually will do it. And that's why we say, now we have predictability. And then once you get that velocity, and in your backlog, you have the number, you can actually predict when you can do a release. So that's where you get the release burn down. So, you know, instead of a spring burn down, you can actually put together a bunch of features stories that you want to release for a sprint looks the same and then you can see instead of days every sprint how you're progressing so there is there is the there is the uh, there is the velocity and the velocity is basically uh, you can get for the sprint burn down as well as the release burn down okay makes sense so far any question yes where do you teach, how do you get the uh, You just take a victory number according to you. You start out, the, the, here's the thing, with new teams or new projects or new, uh, it's like the, the numbers will become very variable at the start. It's like so maybe a guess, say what we think we can finish is a guess. And after the first spin, what we usually use is the history. Okay, the last spin, we were able to finish this. Maybe we'll use this number the next time around. And then what you will notice is, uh, it will, it might rise, it might fall, but over time, it will normalize, it will start stabilizing. Because the other part of it is, you start estimating on a regular basis, you become better estimators as to the type of work that you're doing, you become more familiar with the domain. The other part is, ah, estimating becomes such a regular thing. Ah, building this team generally takes how many points? I think we can estimate it this. So, because you're doing it repeatedly, you become better as the person. And also, you become familiar with the domain. So, those things will 
tend to normalize. Yeah. Some people don't do it by Fibonacci. You can do it with what they call t-shirt sizing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, generally, like with t-shirts, we have only like five or so sizes, right? Like, Small, so, large, So you can, you can also go by that. Um, okay, daily scrum. So this is more or less the concept is clear, right? Backlog, main backlog. Yes. Um, what happens to the tasks that you were supporting over and what you created for this? What happens to that and main issue? You don't count point for that. It goes to the next. Yeah, it, it's up to the product owner to say, ah, okay, you weren't able to finish this, then we'll adjust the plan for that. So that kind of goes back to the product backlog. Or yeah, it's more like or maybe we modify the most product process. So at the start of your project, you, you said to your customer or your product owner, we'll pay you something, but they don't know yet because it's not Yes. yes. Or, or we have yes, a guess. Answer is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's the, that's, that's the thing that you need to make the customer understand. It is, it's an estimate. Even the whole initial sizing thing is an estimate. And what we'll say is, we know that right. as the project progresses, we will become better. Yeah, it doesn't say that you don't know what the heck we'll produce, we'll do something. You say, we'll try this. Yeah, and we have an estimate. <laughs> this is a present thing. Yes, that's the thing. It's like, make that. That's, 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 what, that's why you need to collaborate with the customer and make them understand why it's still a rough estimate. It's not so much that we're not making an estimate, you will be making an estimate. It's just that right now, this estimate is very unbelievable. You can actually involve the PO yeah. in the in the sizing, in the poker. You can include it. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like it's just making sure that the client is informed that this is a rough it's not it's not saying totally there's no guess. It's like this is a guess. This is our best guess right now. The next time around we'll make a better guess. Making them understand that that it's a guess. It's not it's a commitment. Okay. Um so once this is running within the fifteen days period, for example, every day you do a scrum meeting. So what is a scrum meeting? It's a stand-up meeting, literally standing up. So uh, yeah, you don't sit down for that meeting because the theory is if you sit down, it will not be done in 15 minutes. That's for sure. So there is a there is a psychological connection between standing and talking or sitting and talking. So it's a stand-up meeting and you do it religiously. And in the team, you actually set your penalty for not being on the scrum meeting. And you, you set it at a time which is convenient to you and you as a team manage it. But that is a very important part of the scrum. Uh, in fact, as it says, it is scrum. So you have to do it. Now, it only talks about three questions. Now, no matter how big or small the team is, okay, the team size should be within 3 to 10. Uh, generally, that's the rule. Uh, that's the workable, and then if you have bigger than that, you make it into two teams or multiple teams. Now that's where the term scrum of scrum comes in. So, but we we'll do that in a while. So you ask three questions: What have you done yesterday since the last 24 hours? What are you? What do you plan to do in the next period? And if there was any impediment, that's it. Those are the only three questions you deal with, standing together. Uh, and you do not solve problem, so that's not a problem solving meeting. Otherwise, it will never be done in 15 minutes. The uh, idea there of a stage scrum is to coordinate the work. It's like, ah, you're working on this, you're working on this, you're working on this, you're working on this. Ah, uh, okay, I'm working on this. We need to talk afterwards because your work will be done. So it's a way to synchronize the work together because you're working as a team. And your the work that you're doing might affect the others. The design meeting can actually follow right up. Yeah. So afterwards, it's like to raise issues. It's it's the place to to oh okay I have a problem here. Okay, we'll talk about that after. But at least every day the whole team meets and that's how they work. So that's uh, the the uh, daily definition of that. That's a very important thing. You want to touch on that? Okay. So. Um, the next thing is, at the end of the sprint, we have this sprint review, right? Now, the conflict usually comes between a misunderstanding of what we say, we're done. Because ideally, when the team says, we're done, 
What does that mean? It should be a common definition of what uh, that everyone means agrees. according to the definition of the product owner as well as the team. Because if the, the product owner says, oh, when you say you're done with this, I expect this to be able to release it tomorrow. And the team might say, well, that's not, we can't do that right now because we don't have a capability to do a user acceptance test. So then they have to come to a mutual agreement as to what yes. that means. And if, according to that mutual agreement, the definition of that, the client, ah, the, the team hasn't satisfied that, then you can technically say, well, this item, even if you say you're 95%, it's not done. It's not part of your delivery. Then so it's not part of the velocity. So, there, so in that sense, it's like the whole thing is a waste because you made it through 95%, but it's not something that's usable because only the 100% done is usable. Okay. But you can actually finish the five person and gain the point on it. The next yeah. Thing. So the next time around, then when you size it, maybe it's smaller now. So but the still, average will make up average velocity of the two sprints will make up. The scrum of scrum, on the other hand, is if you have multiple teams working on the same project, after the daily scrum. The Scrum uh, members from each team can meet up and update each other about what is being done by each team. So this is when you start having larger and larger teams. So people have done have 500, man, uh, 500 man teams also. Yeah, they have Scrum or Scrum of Scrums. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, possible to scale. Yeah. Um, and so the idea is, it's like, again, the point of the Scrum is to coordinate work. So if uh, as a team, uh, the work of the team impacts another team, then they have to meet up again on a daily basis. Again, it's connected to that concept of feedback. We need to know what everyone else is doing, and we need to know it on a daily basis so that we can coordinate the work. OK, so that's about uh, most of the item I have. I'll still touch on the distributed in a while. I'll just move to Kanban now. So Kanban is the other agile method and in some organization Kanban is getting to be more popular than Scrum. So what's the difference? Uh, what's the key difference? The key difference here is still do a product backlog. Okay, uh, You still do the sizing etc. But the key is there is no time box. So Kanban do not have a time box as in Scrum. So what does it have? Well, um, so the methodology comes from the Toyota production system, um, where basically you just, it, it was done in the uh, manufacturing to go for just in time. And they used to actually run it from supplier down to the car shop, um, yeah, some kind of Kanban. And the idea is, it's a billboard. It's a it's a board. Visualize the system and help it improve on its own. Something like that. Transparency based. Now the so what happens? Okay, this is the backlog. Let's say we define our development as design, develop, QC, and then put into production. Right. So maybe that's the process. You can have as many lines you want depending on your business process. Um, and each you define the criteria of done. So in design, when is it done doing the design? You have to define it in your own business logic. So you have to have a document maybe, you need to finish your UI maybe, or you do a wireframe or whatever it is that you define as the criteria of done. Now, there is this term called WIP, work in progress. So what you do is, in each lane, you only maintain so many at the same time. Okay, so what, how does it differ? Uh, you pick up one item and you work on making it shippable or marketable by the end of it. In, in Kanban, generally the items are a little bigger. Okay, um, there is no time box, so you move the item. Let's say someone is handling the design, you put at any point of time three, 
and then once it's on the waiting here, the developer pulls it, and then the developer, once he's done with it, he drops it here, the QC pulls it from there, and once it's ready, he drops it there for someone to put it to the production. That's generally the process. If anyone is having difficulty with a task, uh, so there's the concept of uh, and on cord comes in. In manufacturing, they literally had a cord which you pull and actually you stop the whole production line by pulling the cord. Uh, the line goes on and then everyone comes and helps you resolve it. And then you get the whole production line going. It's a bit counterintuitive. In the beginning when the American Ford and others were studying the system, they were saying, that's kind of stupid because you know, you're going to stop the whole production line, you're going to delay the whole thing. But um, when actually even Ford and others adopted it down the line, because they found that putting everyone's brain together and fixing the bottlenecks is better than trying to still stretch on. And then what will happen is you will have a lot of waste. Uh, there will be pile up in each stage and there are choke points because the whole theory theory of constraints is that you know the weakest link so if you're if you're weak, your whole chain is as strong as the weakest link so this theory goes by that you fix the weakest link as soon as there is a problem so the whole whole production line is smooth and flowing this works better for those POs that doesn't have the patience for a time box um, and those who wants uh, who works very closely with the team so like okay you do this one finish it you do this one you do this one and let me know if there is a problem and that's how those who are very interactive because a lot of them do not want to wait because in, in scrum you don't touch the team for the iteration yeah um the difference between i think kanban and and that's um, strong. Um, this, for example, one, one, one of our clients was saying, well, um, that's fine. Um, we can reduce the, because the minimum length of a scrum sprint is about one week. So the problem is, for example, um, what if that team is also not just implementing new features, but fixing bugs for the existing system? And the problem is, if the bug comes in and it's high priority, They'll have to wait until the next sprint for it to be incorporated into the backlog. So that's when they can start working. So if, for example, the team has already started on one sprint, one week sprint, and the bug comes in on a Monday afternoon, that means the minimum time that they can work on it is the next Monday, because that's when they start planning for the next one, and that's when they can do it. The idea being, once the team has committed to the set of items that you're doing for one week, you're not supposed to change that. Now, in Kanban, uh, it's a quick, quick constant. Yeah, the idea is, uh, okay, if everybody on the team is working on something, then put it, put the item as the next uh, item top priority. Meaning, the moment somebody is free to do that, to get started on that bug, they can get started on it, but so they don't have to wait for that one week. The moment anybody is available to start working on that. For example, uh, let's say your process of, of uh, resolving bugs is analysis, and then uh, fix, and then QA, and then fraud. Uh, okay, the moment that somebody is available to start analyzing, maybe they're done with, uh, uh, they're done with what their current work is, Okay, so I'm done analyzing this and pass it on to development to, to fix. The moment a resource is free, then they can pull that item in. So they can respond a lot quicker. You know? Now, um, the way I think about Canva is um, two things. Huh? Uh, the most important thing in Canva is making sure that the flow is constant, the flow of work is constant. The idea being that if your work flow is constant. Everybody is working on something, right? If, for example, everybody is doing is doing something, you know, uh, for example, I have 
let's say, three designers. I have three developers. I have three QA. And all of them are doing something at any point in time. Then I can't put in any more work, right? Unless I have more people. That's their maximum capacity. That's where they are most efficient. Because everybody's working on something. It's not like nobody's waiting around sitting for, for something to come and in. Once you have identified the sizes, in, in this approach, you try to make the backlog more or less similar size yeah. as much as possible. But then, your goal is to make sure that everybody's working on something. Now, product backlog serves to prioritize and say, well, everybody's working on something, but are they working on the most important thing? So that's where, okay, the most important thing is always at the top of the backlog. So whoever is available to work on that, okay, grab it, start working on that, because that's the most important thing. As you're finishing the work, the work comes in and gets prioritized. So your goal is to make the team so productive that everybody's working um, on something all the time and they're working on the most important thing. And the goal is if you can make that consistent. Because what in the reality is you will see later on, ah, okay, there will be bottlenecks. They will say, ah, okay, um, there's not enough. I mean, the work of QA is too much. It's like two developers, I might have one QA, and the amount of work that these two developers are generating is too much for one QA. So therefore, I'm going out. None of us, they're doing, um, the done part starts piling up. And then the QA, they can only do so much. Because there's only so much of them, you know, or it takes a long time. So the idea there is, okay, now I see inefficiencies in my system. Ah, maybe I need to add another QA so that because <coughs> otherwise other team members come in. Maybe or enough. maybe other team members can help out. You know, there's no point in building and building if it cannot be tested and cannot be rolled out. So the other guys now go and start helping out. So so your goal in Kanban is to make the whole process efficient. You get the cycle time in terms of like let's say on an average this size task takes us three days to put in production. That's what is the cycle time. And you kind of try to make sure more or less, uh, now if it is three and there's a six, the six takes roughly twice of that or something like that. So you try to do that cycle time and you, you manage that cycle time. So instead of velocity, which is the focus in the scrum, in Canva is the cycle time per item. That's what you focus on. That is. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be. But what Kanban is focused on is cycle. like yeah, cycle time and making the whole process efficient. So it's you like, actually pick it up, even if you're not a tester, you pick it up to make the cycle. Yeah. You, you the idea there is you start seeing the inefficiencies in your process and you basically have this uh, the idea of, of, of for example Kanban is we need continuous improvement. So as we're seeing where the inefficiencies are, we make adjustments so that the whole process is uh, efficient. So it's not just, oh, we're good at QA. It's like, what if you're good at QA, but the developers are so slow in fixing the bug, so we can't test anything. So maybe we can reduce the number of QA people here because they're under utilized. So what Kanban does is it exposes those inefficiencies, and your goal is, uh, make the whole thing ideally go to the go to that state where everybody is doing something, and then by controlling the list of items that are being done, as by ordering them, what the product owner does is still okay. I want you to be working on the most important thing, and if everybody in the team is working on something, that's all you can ask from the team. Right? They're all working their best on the most important thing. So that's how you make the team hyper-productive. Any question? Yes. Um, if Kanban has no time box, do you still have the concept of iterations and early releases? No. Your, your release is, again, something that you can... This one. Minimal marketable, minimal yeah. marketable feature, each item. So the release. idea is, you can release on after they're done. You actually have a fine-grained control. Like, 
um, do I want to release now? Or it's like it's a little bit like scrub in the sense that it's potentially each item is potentially shippable. But if you can control and say, I want to finish all these items before I do another release. Or it can be like if it's a bug, high priority bug, I'll just release that as quickly as possible. That's what you determine if it is for production. So like he said, you might want to pile 10 items together for the release. So you let them wait there and then you put them in production when the 10 is done. Or you do it the other way. You put every item that is coming out of the queue into production after doing your regular testing. Yes. Um, so what happens like Amazon, Google, that even have this is come right. Yeah. Kanban, uh, any software companies uh, using Kanban? A lot of them, actually most of them use it together. Yeah. Like with us, what we do is uh, most of the time the main production phase is Scrum and as soon as it gets into stabilizing and enhancement, it goes to Kanban. Well actually, that's the, uh, um, again, I, I go back to that concept of uh, Agile of uh, what works in your situation. So, it's not to say you need to be exclusively Scrum or you need to be exclusively And different teams like, in that company is also uses yeah. Kanban. So it can be, this is what works for us. Like for example, um, I remember a client saying, ah, we're using Kanban because part of the work that the team is doing is bug fixes. And the problem with Scrum, the limitation with Scrum is that even if we cut it down to uh, a sprint to one week, it takes still too long. So one way around it is we implement the Canva, and that works better for us. So the important thing is for the team to say, ah, this is what works for us, and therefore we can adopt it. So there are some organizations that use Canva, and there are some using, some using Scrum. So it's not an ex it doesn't have to be Even an inside Microsoft, um, they have different groups choosing different, and even same groups having different uh, systems with whatever works for them. Any other? Okay, I'll now move to the, uh, okay, before I move there, so this, this is just a view of how the boards differ, the Scrum board and the Kanban board. Because the board is actually around, the you know, whole control mechanism around which you kind of do all the communication, right? I have a question, uh, sorry, uh, can I go back to the Kanban? Okay, this um, from the diagram, um, where does customer feedback come from, or doesn't have any? What customer feedback? Um, uh, just like Scrum, um, when we are um, sprinkled in production. Yeah. Part of it, or it could be part of your use. I mean, you know, these lanes are, uh, as I are, say. Are, you don't have to, like, the idea is, if for example you want to incorporate feedback, like yeah, coming from it, then you add an item and say, okay, this is part of the process where the customer reviews the product or something. So you can add that in and say, so the idea is you can modify the process and then say, is the pro process optimal? So most of the time that is there, like in, in some of our maintenance projects, there is a link which is customer review. And then after that, you put it in production. Okay, so these are just a view. So generally, day one of a sprint is like that. You have all the tasks and then it starts moving. And ideally, last day of the sprint, it should look like that. So it has all reached the done state, right? And uh, generally, one scrum team works with one board. That's generally the process. And that's the product backlog and that's generally how it moves. Um, it's actually post-it notes. I think since the Agile post-it stocks went up. What <laughs> <laughs> uh, Now this is Kanban. Now Kanban can actually have multiple teams also. So multiple teams can work. So like, you know, your business analysts focus on one and then certain groups, developers focus on this and there is a approver or something like that. So they, there can be multiple teams working on one large board. Um, I don't know that's about it. And then, yeah, yeah, no, the idea in Kanban is there's no time box. So this can happen anytime. It's yeah, like it's the same. Works, the work flows across and it goes up and they work. So it's always like this. 
Yeah, so there is there's always item on each lane. Unlike in this, there are. So in this one, there's always certain item, number of items. Uh, distributed team and its challenges. So, okay, now we're talking about the realities of most of our business because uh, if you're doing offshore projects or even if your client is in the client's office and not in your own office uh, or if you have two or three different companies collaborating on a project how do you do agile because some of the key criteria uh, which were like you know interaction um, then customer collaboration etc gets challenged immediately by the fact that you are not in one room, right? Um, so there, communication and collaboration is the key, but the market realities actually require you to work with a distributed team. Now, the other part is, well, this is called Conway's Law. So basically, once you start dividing the team, or actually, this one says, the software coming out of any organization actually represents the organization itself. So if your company is good, then the software is good, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but the point here is, this one, if you have a divided team and if it is not well managed, the software has a tendency to have that. If you have a dysfunctional team, there are more problems in the software. Um, okay, now, most of the time, the problem starts when a distributed team does the agile the same way as those in one place or co-located team do. Meaning, they still have the scrum board, they still do the stand up by talking, etc. And that starts the problem. So a lot of, lot of uh, agile practitioners might have been, well, it's changing now, but used to say that agile cannot be done in a distributed team. But the realities have changed over the time. There are several books now on it. So, the, but these are the challenges to be identified up front and be ready for. Now, okay, the formal requirement document which used to be there in a traditional method is not there anymore. So the knowledge is sometimes a difficulty. If you add a new member or change the member, etc., too much. So if your team has too much turnaround, agile can be a problem because the knowledge retention is key. Um, then, okay, now if the product owner is very busy in his own country most of the time, and even if he is flying in and all, a lot of time, uh, especially like we faced it in banking solutions, um, it has very uh, typical um, you know, very complex requirement, etc. which uh, we as developers, it's not common sense, you know, banking laws, our <laughs> systems are not common sense, right? So you need, now, if they might not have enough time to clarify all your doubts and questions. So that's where you might need to augment with what we call a subject matter expert uh, on show. Then, uh, well, yeah, and, and there are, you know, a lot of times uh, about a certain thing, like say, logging. There's so many small talks around that, which sometimes doesn't capture, get captured in a user story. So, um, when in a co-located situation, there's a lot of talks and discussions where you kind of catch up on that. But if it is just with the user story and thrown over by email, uh, it's very hard to get the whole uh, essence of the story because just the word kind of doesn't always define it that's a challenge and okay the last one but one of the most important trust and recognition because remember individual and interaction was supposed to be the key in agile and as soon as it's across the ocean that becomes a challenge how do you how do you maintain the trust uh, among the team like you know somebody you have met yeah. Because in, in co located teams where you're sitting in one room, it's very easy to develop <coughs> good relationships. You can see the nuances of you saying, My estimate is five, days, maybe. And you type in, uh, My estimate is five days, maybe. It's a very different thing. Right? You know that five days, maybe, with somebody looking up, it's a very 
uh, unlikely prospect. Maybe it's 10 days. But if you write it in email, there's so there's a lot lost in not having the physical uh, physical contact. So some of the solutions, some of the approaches that we have found to work, and some of those that have been shared by some of the best practices globally. Um, number one, plan in a lot of travel. So you know, uh, it shouldn't be that you know we are outsourcing work and we're not going to see each other ever. So something like that. Uh, you you kind of convince them that you know plan in a certain budget. Now it's better for the PO to come and meet the team rather than the whole team going and meeting the PO. So that can work for them. But you know, it, it, these are some things you have to work out as business people as a team. That travel. So the the human element is important, and you plan it in from uh, beginning. Then slow, grow slow. This is one key important thing. Don't jump the team size to like 10 people or something uh, the next day, because that is going to create a lot more problem than solution. So generally, when there's a new member, assign a mentor. The mentor kind of you know the, shares the knowledge and gets the person ingrained into it. Um, the other one that works well if you have two teams in two different location, uh, buddy system. Uh, from both sides, so you know they kind of work and review and all, so they keep in sync and stuff. Um, okay, this one is generally what tends to happen. Like, okay, the Manila team do the QC and we'll do the backend. Uh, that is a recipe that doesn't work too well. So it should be by stories. So the Manila team does this story. Talks and all should be able to be caught there with like a instant message there or a chat or a wall or some format. Each story so that while it's being built and developed, there is enough knowledge built up behind it. Uh, and um, lastly, it's good to have some kind of, um, you know, bringing the social media aspect, like Facebook kind, to the team. So chats and knowing each other should go beyond just the work to build that interpersonal relationship and trust. And uh, yeah, that's, that's mainly. And the last slide I have is one which Boch Dash comes. So this we are talking about fitness. So this is the first scrum specifically writing the requirement in a executable format. Basically, you know, you can write, uh, once you do some research, you find fitness, it's spelled, uh, there's a E, I think, at the end of it, uh, fitness with a E. Uh, once you find that tool, you can write the requirement in a tabular format, and then once, um, they can be connected to your codes, and it can be tested, like if it doesn't pass, it turns red, and then it turns green, and then as you keep building, it does like a regression testing across the stack, and it will tell you if uh, whatever you built has affected something previously built, etc. And so that's that's on this one. Yeah, mini space behind each story. So okay, if it is a distributed team, there has to be more amount of written work. Uh, that is something you cannot avoid. How to reduce it is a question that team has to figure. Uh, what works for them, but there has to be more written work than just verbal, uh, which works for a uh, same side. And yeah, this one, the, it's better to do more review of the backlog by the team and then clarifying it. Because a lot of times what happens is while going in the spring, then they uh, discover that, oops, this is not clear, uh, there is a blocker. Now, since the other guy might be sleeping at that time, uh, you, know, <laughs> you cannot call out the phone uh, at that time. So that can become a loss of 12 hours or 24 hours or something like that. So it's better to clarify all the questions before the start of the sprint, which could have been uh, easier in a, in a localized team. That's, that's about it. Do I have anything more? Um, probably that's... Um, just the, the challenge of co-located, um, I mean, it's easy to develop if you're in one room, but if you're distributed, 
there's a, obviously a communication gap. But the thing is, what we do is we, com we compensate for that gap by adding more tools, like, for example, Skype, Google Hangout. And the important thing is, again, individuals and interaction. So it's very important to develop trust relationships between, it's not like, oh, I don't know you. It's like, over time, people tend to become friends over Facebook. So that's a very natural thing, and it's a thing that you want to encourage because in the end, it's about working well together, even across these different locations. So, um, okay, what's the plan? So we are running, obviously, late. So um, now, what we plan to do is uh, 15 minutes.